Hi everyone, I'm Lupe and I'm an advocate on Women in Films Helpline. I wanted to share some of the ways that we are working to support our community during this challenging time. First, the Hire Her Back Fund is a fund that Women in Film created in partnership with Women in Film and Television Atlanta and New York Women in Film and Television, offering $1,000 grants to any of our members who are facing financial hardship. The grants are distributed by the Actors Fund. Please find more information on eligibility and how to apply by going to the Actors Fund website, actorsfund.org. If you need help or if you have any questions, you can contact Genevieve Winters at gwinters at wif.org. The Helpline is also starting up a second run of our Black member support space in the winter of 2021. The Black member support space is a virtual peer support group for Black women and non-binary folks in the industry to have a comfortable and safe place to explore and discuss challenges, concerns, and issues, including but not limited to their experiences of racism, sexism, and other systemic biases in the screen industries. The Black member support space is co-facilitated by Ashley Merriman, another one of our lovely helpline advocates, um, an anti-racist social worker along with Dr. Mary Jane Sims, psychologist and consultant. To register and find out more information, you may email at ashley at amerriman at wif.org. Finally, just a reminder that the helpline is here to support anyone experiencing harassment, discrimination, or misconduct in the entertainment industries. Please call us for support and information about legal help and future support spaces. Our phone number is 855-WIF-LINE, L-I-N-E. Thank you. And now our panel for today. First, welcome Gretchen Hildebrand and Vivian Vasquez, co-directors of Decade of Fire, a film that confronts the racially charged stereotypes that dehumanized residents of the South Bronx in the 1970s and rationalized their abandonment by city, state, and federal governments. Vasquez, in her role as the film's central character, seeks not only healing for her community, but to redeem them from the harmful mythology spread by the media that's continued largely unchallenged to this day. Next, please welcome Stephanie Wong-Brial, director of Blowing Up, a film in which a team of rebel heroines working within a broken criminal justice system work to change the way women arrested for prostitution are prosecuted. The film celebrates acts of steadfast defiance, even as it reveals the hurdles these women must face. Our next guest is Marge Safinia, co-director and producer with Grace Lee of And She Could Be Next, a two-part documentary series about women of color transforming American politics from the ground up. Our final guest is Nicole Noonan, one of the directors, along with Jim Lebrecht, of Crip Camp, A Disability Revolution. This film takes us back to the early 1970s, when teenagers with disabilities faced a future shaped by isolation, discrimination, and institutionalization. Camp Jenid, a ramshackle camp, for the handicapped, a term no longer used, in the Catskills exploded those confines. The camp was their freewheeling utopia, a place with summertime sports, smoking and makeout sessions awaiting everyone, and campers experienced liberation and full inclusion as human beings. Our moderator for today is Amita Sarkeesian, a media critic and producer who thrives at the intersection of digital culture, accessibility, and social justice, who sparked a paradigm shifting conversation about improving the representations of marginalized people in video games and popular culture. And now I'll turn it over to Anita and our guests. Hi everyone, I'm glad to be back here. I love these uh, panels that Women in Film puts on because I get the opportunity to meet and hang out with so many amazing filmmakers. So it's an honor to be here with all of you. Thank you for your time. Um, okay, so I know that this goes by really fast. So I'm just gonna not ramble and dive into my first question. One of the things I, I think a lot about with documentary filmmaking is the situatedness of the filmmaker, whether you are in the community that you are speaking to or of, or whether you are an outsider documenting what you're learning through it. And I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about like your position as the filmmaker in your films and what that relationship was like on either side of those, either side of that position. or not. <laughs> All right, I'll jump in. I'll jump in. I was trying to be polite, but I'm nah. being polite. 
Um, yeah, I'm really glad it's your first question. I think this is like, uh, for me at least, a very central issue of our field and this moment and uh, the time that we're in and narrative power and the power that our stories have to shape and define cultures and people. Um, and maybe it's time for us to think about those ideas, you know, in a different way than uh, documentary, which is a really extractive form of art making um, historically, you know, has been. So I, I think it's a super relevant thing for us on And She Could Be Next. Uh, our entire creative team were women of color. Um, uh, myself and my partner Grace, who can't be here today, but uh, our third producer and then a whole host of uh, other women of color directors who we worked with because our story is really vast and concurrent. We had to shoot in a lot of places at the same time. Um, uh, and I think that for me, at least in, in my work more broadly, I'm always trying to make sense of myself. I'm always trying to make sense of my identities, um, I, I, my otherness um, and sort of a community, you know, a sense of community for people who sort of feel, you know, outside of the mainstream. So uh, for us, it was absolutely central on And She Could Be Next that this was a story by and about women of color, for sure. Did someone else have thoughts about this? You know, when um, Crip Camp first came onto my radar, it was um, it told to me by Jim Lebrecht, my co-director, um, who was pitching me ideas about disability that he thought I could take on as a filmmaker because he was tired of not seeing as a sound mixer working in documentary for many years, the kinds of stories out of disability community that he would have liked to have seen. Um, and the ideas were kind of interesting, but the thing that really caught my attention was at the end of this meeting, he said, but you know what I've really always wanted to see is a story about my summer camp. And then he started telling me this story and it completely blew my mind. And I saw some pictures later that made me really excited. But, um, you know, from the very beginning, that was sort of the question was like, well, you know, but this is his story. And yeah, he wasn't a director, but he was somebody who had been sitting watching documentaries and talking with directors about them for so long. And, um, and so I asked him if he would co-direct it with me. Um, and it was a really um, amazing partnership that I think um, challenged a lot um, of my memories of how I had worked in the past with communities and made me kind of rethink, um, you know, I've always tried to work very collaboratively about communities that I've told stories with and, and work with people and communities, but to, to work in, in this level, especially on a, a personal film that's um, exploring a, a, a history that had been kind of repressed and untold, you know, um, with someone who lived that history was um, was a different order entirely, and um, and so it's just been um, you know really really humbling and really eye opening for me, and um, a significant part of my journey and kind of thinking about these issues that you're raising. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Stephanie, Gretchen, or Vivian, did you have any thoughts on this question about being sort of the insider outsider approach to filmmaking? Also, if you don't or think the question is boring, we can just move on. <laughs> I'm not precious. Well, yeah, no, I'd like to add that yeah, um, in Decade of Fire, um, I'm the narrator. I am co-director, co-producer, and I'm also in the story. And so I am, the story is not just about a community. It's about my community and it's about me, right? So the, it was sort of all in one and um, it was my first film. I'm not... A, a traditional filmmaker. This is my first film. Um, Gretchen was the expert. On the other hand, I think that the work that we did, um, the four of us, there were four of us working on the team, um, was very much consensus driven and, you know, our values held to that. Um, so much so that um, I was involved in it almost just about every aspect of the filmmaking process not having been a filmmaker and, and any decision about the, uh, the framing of the film, the framing of the story, the folks we were interviewing, all of it was, uh, you know, all of us had a hand in it and especially myself. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I think that Gretchen, who um, is not from the South Bronx, did not live the experience of the fires in the South Bronx um, as my partner really pushed me to become a director 
in ways that, um, you know, this film, I would say, was, is not extractive, right? Because it's my story and um, I help shape it. Um, and, uh, you know, even when we went into here for sound, right? Um, I was pushed, um, you know, your, um, your director in Crip Camp actually was my coach in sound. I mean, I never, I had never been in a sound room for a film and here he was asking me what I thought, what I wanted. And I thought, oh my God, this was really incredible. Um, so in terms of the relationship that I had to the documentary was sort of one of uh, great intimacy, but also one of great power that I just I I was given that I um, that I also uh, manifested, but at the same time it was power that was given to my community because uh, it's it's been received really well as a story that needed to be told, um, and so I'm just very proud of that. I, it. It, I just want to say that it took a very long time to get there, right? It, it was a very long process because my learning curve was that much higher and greater. Um, but, and Gretchen can speak to that because she had experience with filmmaking. I did not, but um, I'm sort of glad it went that way. I don't think the film would have been the, as successful as it was or wouldn't have been as... Um, as uh, intimate as it was, if it not, had not been for Vivian, the character being the director and producer at the same time. Do you, sorry, uh, just really quick. I'm curious, like, do you, are you making more films? It, did it spark an interest in filmmaking or is this just like, I've told my story and I go back to my life? Well, we're working on smaller modules uh, that are linked to the film um, around areas that people want to know more about. For example, uh, you know, what is the, um, the financial control board and how is privatization making decisions that affect the public, right? We made, this, we made a, a small module around housing activism and organizing. Um, what I am interested in pursuing is really how people tell their stories. Um, so it may or may not be in the future about filmmaking, but it is, you know, definitely something I'm interested in about, and that is how you bring community um, to tell stories, their nice. own stories. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. there, and, oh, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'll just piggyback on what Vivian was saying, which is that the partnership went both ways. Um, that while we spent a lot of, you know, like it was a very laborious process, but it really, and and it was like, felt like we were inventing something <laughs> because it definitely wasn't the like training that you get in film school or that I got in film school, like working with a team of people maybe who don't, haven't made films before. Um, but I also, you know, I, I not only, I was like, new to the Bronx. I was new to New York when I started this project. And, um, and part of what we, one of the resources and assets of the film was actually the community. And Vivian was really the conduit and that time that it took for us to really earn the trust of the community and like, find the story that we felt confident putting out there, because none of us is a historian or an investigative journalist or, you know, like, what find, finding the grounding of it. And um, so it was, while I brought this certain set of skills to the table as part of our collaboration, I also learned just as much <laughs> through that process and, and the time it took was really critical. Um, although um, hopefully we could do something faster next time. <laughs> I was just gonna comment that I really love what Vivian said about power and how she was given the power um, through this relationship and through this work, the power to represent her community, to give her community a voice. And I think that that's something that I'm constantly thinking about whenever I enter a space, because I mean, most of my films are all about women and girls of color, but women and girls of color who are going through different experiences than I've experienced in my life. And so, you know, I always start off a project with a deep amount of immersion, you know, because the power dynamics are real. You know, I have all the power. And so I never bring a camera into a room until I fully feel like I'm allowed and given permission. And so that can take, you know, 
usually 10 months to a year. And during that time, instead, I just watch and observe because every space that I enter, there are so many dynamics going on, so many different perspectives. And I always just try to come into each of my films as an observer, as a pure verite documentarian without a point of view um, and learn what those perspectives are so that I can fully represent them and make sure I capture them and document them in some shape or form throughout the filming process. So the power dynamics are shared in a sense because I'm only able to film certain things because I've been given the consent by the different teams or groups that are representing this issue. And I think that that's something that um, is really important to me in terms of how I look at my role and the power that I have as a director coming into different communities. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love that, especially um, your film Blowing Up is so, some of the people that are represented are so vulnerable just in the, and in, in the, 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 um, responsibility you have to putting them on camera and, and what that means. Um, so it's, ni it's nice to hear that um, you spent so much time sort of figuring out what that meant for you and your role in, in being a storyteller in that regard. Um, I just wanna remind folks that if you have questions, please pop them in the Q&A box and then we will be, we'll get to them after at some point during, I don't know, whenever I feel like it. <laughs> um, so I have a question that sort of is dividing y'all into different camps um, a little bit because I, I watched all of these kind of back to back over like two, three days. And, you know, it, it struck me that films like Crip Camp and Decade of Fire are uncovering this history that we didn't know about or that many people didn't know about and, and how important that is. And I think about, you know, being a feminist activist and, and making sure that I understand the legacy that I'm being that my work is rooted in today and, and, and covering that importance, like um, Crip Camp especially, I was like, yo, I thought I was like intersectional and cool and I had no idea that this movement happened. You know, like I had no idea that that the things that I, I see and exist in this world um, around like infrastructure with disability rights was aggressively fought for, right? And likewise with um, Decade of Fire, like, I. I never even heard of any of this before, right? And I, and how important and valuable that is. In contrast, when I was watching Blowing Up and um, and She Could Be Next, it felt like uh, documenting this moment in time, right? Like right now we need to capture what's happening. So this distinction between like, you need to know where we came from to understand where we are now. And this moment of like, right now is so important. you got to understand how, like where we're going forward. Can you speak a little bit to that, um, to, you know, the the impetus of telling those particular stories in the ways that you're telling them? You're all being fairy. I can call on you if you'd like. <laughs> Nicole, do you want to start first? I love the way you frame that. Um, you know, I think about that all the time, actually. I think about the ways in which these stories have been suppressed you know, um, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that, um, you know, you guys on, on Decade of Fire and anybody else who's worked on one of these kind of historical activist films, it becomes kind of enraging over the course of the time that you're researching it and trying to find the archival footage and trying to find the way to tell the story as you sort of feel the weight of how the story has actually been kind of written out of, out of history. Um, and for us that, um, you know, that manifested itself in like, um, uh, literally like, you know, there would be a whole series of tapes of a show, but somehow the, the show about disability, um, you know, just never got saved and wasn't there. And we had to like hunt around until we found some activist who had actually managed to record it on a CD-ROM and, you know, we, we put that in the film. Um, or literally like uh, people, disability activists had given boxes of their um, archival materials to libraries who had never bothered to actually um, even go through the boxes and itemize what was in them. So we had to, you know, send researchers in to just like sift through stuff that had like was still in the little paper bags that it had, you know, come in uh, to the library in. And, um, and so, uh, 
I felt a huge weight of responsibility to try to like to to try to make a film that actually would reach a large audience just because it seemed like this was this moonshot of having, you know, marshaled this team and had having the resources to actually um, kind of find all these tiny little fragments and and piece them together. Um, and in some cases, um, you know, we were uh, reawakening the memories of some of the people who were even in the film who didn't really remember that they had been involved in this march or that this thing had played out in this way, you know? Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I guess I, I guess I, it, the film coming out this year in a, um, in a summer of, you know, people in the streets, um, I, I, and, and, you know, seeing these other films come out about the movements of today, I felt the, I felt the intersection between these stories out of history and these stories of right now, you know, um, and how it, it felt like, it, it felt like the, that particular past, especially of activism in the 70s, and the moment of today just seemed to be just kind of colliding to the point where, um, you know, somehow, uh, somehow they were they were very close in a way that I could feel those um, <laughs> years of these stories sort of being discounted. In the case of the disability rights movement to the point where, like you said, it's as though the kind of collective story that we tell each other has been, we were so nice, we gave people the ADA, you know, um, that um, it just, it felt like a really uh, powerful time to be changing that narrative and kind of, um, in connection to all the incredible activism that's happening right now and the and the disabled activists and especially uh, disabled activists of color who are who are on the front lines of the movements today. Yeah, I, I feel like uh, if you look at any progress that's ever happened, it's always at the labor of the struggle of the, you know, the the uh, effort of activists who make it happen, like labor rights, disability rights, women's rights, civil rights, like all of them, nobody who has power just freely gives up their power. Um, and I thought that that was what was so powerful is just it, even as someone who feels like I'm, you know, educated on this stuff, I'm like, God, I don't know anything, <laughs> you know? I think that it's really, it's a really important reminder to us of how much like progress doesn't just magically happen. And I think the last few years has made that very clear to, to folks. So I guess I'd ask Vivian Gretchen, like how you feel like um, Decade of Fire fits in, like you're telling this historical story, but you know, why, why is it important right now? Like why, why did you need to tell this story and how does it impact today? I'm gonna start and then Gretchen, you can um, follow up and kind of fill the holes, right? Um, but you know, it's interesting. We started with the story about why the South Bronx burned, right? The question was, why did my neighborhood burn? But you know, very early on, realized that the South Bronx has this legacy that it has impacted its people and people all over the country who live in cities today, right? Urban renewal, redlining, um, you know. Um, discrimination, what does that have to do with housing? And what does it have to do with gentrification now, right? And why is it that young people from, you know, poor neighborhoods always walk around with this bravado, with this, you know, kind of like heaviness on their shoulders? Why, what is that? And, uh, you know, we wanted to tell the story of, you know, explaining where may, there may be some reasons why we still have this bravado, you know, why Vivian thinks that she's so big and bad or she's so tough, you know, or whatever. Why do I think that I'm so tough all the time? Um, and it's because I had to create this toughness in order to survive, right? Um, and young people needed to do the same thing and people do that today. Um, and so, you know, it was interesting um, at first, People like Gretchen, funders would ask us questions. Again, this is my my sort of my amateur um, pr presence here, but why is it relevant today? Why is your film so relevant today? And I'm thinking, oh my God, it's completely relevant. You know, our communities still have not, um, you know, uh, uh, been uh, treated equally. You know, we're still being discriminated against. Housing is still an issue. We're facing discrimination. Um, and I think that it took um, as you were mentioning, uh, Stephanie, sort of the power of the archival footage to bring some of those images back to create that sense that people could identify with. And so it wasn't, it, it was, 
in addition to allowing people to uh, remember what happened right to them and to these communities, but also to um, to make it real to folks who were also not involved, people who you know never knew about the South Bronx, but to make it relevant to those people as well. So I don't know, Gretchen, if you want to speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I I think you put it really perfectly that uh, we want we I mean we wanted to make the past relevant to the present because the more we looked at the story and talked about it and kind of figured out the story we wanted to tell, it was not, I mean, when we, especially when we first started making this film, which was in 2008, um, there was actually all this predatory equity stuff going on, like, you know, which is still, I mean, it's New York City, uh, you know, the, the real estate market there is like a churning beast, you know, that never, ever, ever stops. Um, and, and there was this thing of like, oh, it's like, it, it's the opposite of the 70s now because real estate prices are so high and the market's so hot. And in fact, I, I don't know how COVID has impacted this, but up until COVID, you know, the Bronx housing market was the hottest market in New York City. Um, and that is that is just a simple, like them, something like gentrification gets talked about as though it's like some kind of ecology that humans don't control. When in fact, if you take those redlining maps that we have in our film and you put them, like lay them on top of a map of a city, those are the same neighborhoods that are now gentrification hotspots. And it's, it's actual simple economics that because of redlining, the prices were kept down in these neighborhoods. And now there's like, developers can make more if they build there and sell for higher, you know, like it's, it's pure economics. And um, we really wanted to bust that open for people so that we could not only make the past tangible, but give people tools for talking about the crises that we're facing today, because it's, it's almost like it's not distinct. It's like a wheel turning, <laughs> you know, and also linking the, what Vivian's family went through coming to this, you know, to New York from Puerto Rico and how, you know, the burning of the Bronx was really um, just kind of like one, one link in the chain that just hadn't really been explored as part of the historical trauma. Um, but yeah, I, I think that for us, the linkages, we always knew that we needed to make those connections. And, um, and so we do come to that at the end of our, our film as well because nice. it it is all relevant to what's happening today yeah so on the sort of a, a different perspective marjan and stephanie i'd love to hear about like making a film about today and sort of crisis or impacted communities um in this moment and documenting that you want to go first stephanie <laughs> i mean i think we had a great um a sense that we this was a moment of history, right? That when we project forward into our future, we'll be able to look back to this moment where there was sort of a, a sort of um, seismic change in political power in this country and that political power being claimed by women of color. Um, so I think that although I would never consider myself a historical filmmaker 20 years from now, I hope that <laughs> this will actually be this sort of, um, you know, capturing of this moment of history. And we, you know, we were filming in a really interesting, I mean, you know, I, I don't recommend for anyone's health doing an election film because you're always chasing, right? There's, you're chasing and there's like 3000 other cameras and the, the news that's gonna put out that person's story tonight and that's gonna help, you know, and so you are just always elbowing and jock, jockeying for position and access and sort of something that's beyond the kind of headlines. Um, but I think that if we were successful in getting beyond those headlines, especially with these women themselves, it was in that moment of re reminding them that they were actually historical figures, right? That this, that what they were doing in this moment was truly historical and, you know, really was at the moment of change. You know, obviously they didn't, the, their movement also didn't come out of nowhere, but um, there was something sort of seismic about the way that people collaborated across uh, communities of color to build this power, to win power for each other, right? This kind of uh, moment that happened in 2018, we ended up with the most diverse Congress. Of course, we, none of us would know these things, but I remember when it was hard and Grace and I were like tearing our eyelashes out, you know, one by one, banging our heads against the wall. What fueled us was this idea that who knows, 
Maybe 10 years from now, Stacey Abrams will be the first black woman president in this country. Maybe Rashida Tlaib will be the one who solves the crisis in the Middle East when she's secretary of state 20 years from now, right? Like, and, and that kind of understanding that we have to tell this story from the perspective. You know, I think we have a lot of, well, I, we, we have a lot of master narratives, right? We all kind of, Boy Meets Girl is a master narrative, you know, David and Goliath is a master narrative. And I think in this country, we have a master narrative about ep epic political stories, but we'd never seen an epic political story that had centered, you know, a whole array of women of color of, of every kind, um, as candidates, as organizers, as change makers. Um, and so for us, yeah, I think that feeling of like, this is future history happening now was always very present and on our shoulders as, as we were working. Yeah. Yeah, I love, I think that what we're all doing across the board and I get to be last, so it's always fun to sum up things. Um, but it's, I think that when, I just think the lives and struggles of unfortunately of marginalized communities and movements is going to be timeless. Because like you're saying, we, we're, not, we're not meant to be historians, but we are documenting history because so much is happening in these communities that people just weren't aware of and still aren't aware of, you know, like you said, like who knows who this one, this one a representative might become and you guys were following her then, no one knew about her then, but also by doing films about these marginalized communities, we're also putting them front and center on screens so that young girls and boys see them and can have these ideas about themselves for the future, that they don't have to say, yes, 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 they can say no and think about another way and create change. So I think that that's also driving me in terms of the work that I do. Um, I, I feel like, you know, for me making Blowing Up was coming from a perspective of, I feel like prostitution has been rebranded into victims of trafficking, yet it's happening in a courtroom where they're decriminalizing it. What do all these contradictory terms mean? So how can I document a space that is representing that and show how little agency and how much this court is trying to give these women agency and what those terms mean. So documenting this change around sex work, around decrim, around trafficking and prostitution that's happening right now was something that I just felt like for all women and girls to know about um, is really important before we start judging and casting you know, sh shade and blame, et cetera, on what's going on for these women's lives. Great, thank you all for sharing that. Um, I am going to ask two more questions and then I'm gonna go to the Q&A. So I know we already have a few questions in there. If anyone has others, please pop them in. Um, so I want, I, I'm gonna ask like 10 questions in one and you can kind of choose which direction you wanna go with this because I wanna talk about impact, right? That's, this panel is is about impact filmmaking and your films are, sort of defined by that, whether it's intentional or not, or whether you want it to be or not. And so I'm wondering, like, I, like, I kind of just wrote on my notes, like, how do impact, right? Like, how, how does impact actually happen in these spaces? How does, how does real change come out of filmmaking? Um, you know, what tools are you using to marry your storytelling and advocacy in your work? And then, and also, and, or, you know, whatever, whatever direction feels like it, it resonates the most with you to answer this question. But, you know, a lot of, it's almost kind of mandatory these days for, for documentaries to have campaigns that work alongside uh, the documentary, right? Like you don't just make the film, you also make a whole movement attached to your film. And so I'm wondering like, what does that look like? How do you work to empower the communities or maintain a relationship with those communities after the fact? So I know that was a lot, um, but I just want to give you options to answer the thing that feels the most resonant to you all. Um, well, I'm going to just jump in, to, uh, just to respond to one part of what you just said, which was, I think, one of the things that we, I, I think the impact space is kind of being created right now. And it's, it's like, it, in a way, it's like the hot new thing that all the funders and, you know, like, it's, it's uh, much talked about, not very well funded. <laughs> and so not that many people are actually given the tools that they need to do it. So, um, but one, one of the things, and Vivian, I don't know if you want to jump on on this. So we have a, 
a third co-producer, her name's Julia Steele Allen, who was uh, part of this process from the beginning. And she was, you know, me, her, her and Vivian, um, we all were co-producers and she comes from like an advocacy, like um, housing justice place. And so um, it was, uh, she had a lot of clarity that she brought and Vivian as well, cause you work as a community person <laughs> as, and compared to my work as a filmmaker, I think it was really important to dis be distinguished of like, we aren't building a movement. We don't have the tools to build a movement. Building a movement is incredibly, like that's another person's job and that's something that people are working really hard at. And we can, I think the, the challenge is like building trust and also adding, like bringing something to the movement rather than detracting away or asking that movement for something for our film to happen, um, but rather really thinking about how can, what we're doing, um, bring something to the table or even move things forward. Um, and so that, it, it was constantly a dialogue. It wasn't like, oh, once we had that question, then we like knew what to do. It was a process that we went through and Julia spent several years actually putting together our impact um, plan. And we were incredibly fortunate that like we did get funding for that to happen. So we could like, before the film was finished, really map that out. And I just wanna like, in a way, let all filmmakers off the hook of like, you're already as an independent documentary filmmaker, you're already expected to like have eight jobs that you do perfectly. And like, you're supposed to be a business person and know how to do social media. And now you're supposed to know how to like run an impact campaign that like, the, um, it's incredibly important work. And I'd love to talk about the details of the work, but it's um, for it to happen, it actually needs resources. Like the that work of connecting and building trust um, and, and even just figuring out what a movement or an organization or a person might need um, takes time and, and resources. I don't know. <laughs> That's my first thoughts on it. Yeah, great. I love that. Like, are you a filmmaker, an activist? Are you both? Like those identity categories, I think are very personal and it, like really shape the way that you approach this idea of impact, right? Um, any other thoughts around uh, impact building or yeah, I would just echo that statement. I I um, definitely don't start making films to s make impact. I definitely start making films as a filmmaker. I view myself as a filmmaker first and foremost. I fill out all those questions on the grants of what's your outreach campaign? What's your marketing strategy? How do you plan to reach them? You know, I have answers for those because you have to. But I think that the first and foremost thing is just to like find the story and find the best way to tell the story. Um, I think that, you know, I just did actually a, a, did a taught a, did a screening for a Harvard class and they were asking me, you know, like, what was your, what was the impact you wanted to make with this film? And I said, I didn't, I mean, I wanted to start a conversation. And the reason why I didn't ID everyone in my film was because I want people to identify with who they want to identify with. I want them to take away whose story that they found most relevant to them and make them feel differently about the subject matter. That's the impact like that I hoped. I didn't want, I didn't have one final statement of impact that I was trying to say. There's a lot in there in that space that's confusing. And so for me to come in and say, this is an impact that I hope to change. I also agree with Gretchen, it's just, it's impossible that requires so many resources and there's already so many nonprofits, NGOs and within the sex work movement a spectrum of ideas of what's right, the abolitionists versus the sex workers, you know, of what that movement should look like. So who am I as a filmmaker to come in and start directing things? Um, so I always say like, I am a filmmaker first and foremost. If my film, once you've watched it, impacts you, great, how, which way, what did you like? You know, so that's how I always view impact. With um, with Crip Camp, we did something which was, um, you know, I think partially based on my experience wrestling with these exact issues that you guys are talking about um, on films in the past, and that feeling of like, you know, you 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 you're forced to sort of describe the impact campaign and how you're going to run it and what the budget is before you've even really told the story, you know, and so. Um, with us, and this was kind of goes back to the first question, you know, in terms of wanting to make the film in partnership um, with the community, we had to 
um, build into our budget from the beginning, um, you know, making versions that were accessible to people. So we had to do, um, you know, rough cut screenings and fine cut screenings with um, captioning, you know, and, um, and audio description. Um, so we could have kind of cross disability groups of activists come in from today and watch the film and, and give us feedback. Um, where we discovered a lot of like awareness gaps and, and issues with the story in ways that maybe it was close to resonating with some kind of current issue, but not quite. Um, and in so doing, we kind of built up this sort of um, community of folks around the film. And when we had a, um, we're pretty close to completion, we had a big brain trust with kind of a bunch of activists. A lot of it was virtual, even though this was pre pandemic, you know, from from all over the country and um, and sort of asked like, what do you think this film could most do? And we really thought it was gonna be policy that we were gonna sort of be figuring out, okay, we can bring, you know, we knew by that point the film would be on Netflix and all of that and that we could bring this level of awareness to, you know, the sort of policy asks that were most important to the disability activists of the moment. And people basically said, no, it's not policy that this film can impact the most powerfully. It's actually just, it's this, this story represents what's still really needed, which is spaces for people to come together in community in the way that they did in the film, you know? And also the, the, the film and the way people come into community and the story um, would be a perfect kind of um, on-ramp for people to join the disability community which you know, one in four people have a disability, but a much smaller percentage of people identify as having a disability. And obviously like making the tent bigger and bringing more people um, underneath it is gonna make it a more powerful um, group. And so, um, so we, we realized through that that we really wanted to ally with the disability justice movement, which actually remedies um, you know, some of the problems with the earlier disability rights movement in terms of um, inclusion by um, really centering the leadership and, um, and voices and perspectives of uh, people of color and queer people in the disability community who've been you know, marginalized within that community. And we hired two incredible activists um, out of the disability justice movement and pretty much said, you do what you think is, you know, going to most achieve those goals that we heard that people had and and then the pandemic hit and so all these ideas we had of kind of bringing people together you know in these kind of physical sort of uh, crip camps around the country went out the window and we called them up and said like you know what do you think we should wait until next year and they said no 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 like people with disabilities are disproportionately suffering right now this is like the opportunity that we have to do capacity building and really grow the movement um, and really address people where they are right now. So we were able to fundraise for an emergency fund um, to give uh, people some relief due to the pandemic. And we also, um, well, Andrea and Stacy designed this 16 week um, virtual camp that was a, a gathering for people to come together who found out about it because of the film but basically um, gather in community and have teachings from leaders in the disability justice movement on different themes, everything from like internalized ableism to hashtag activism to how to fundraise um, for your work. And um, they thought they would have like 500 people join in, but there were like 10,000 people from all over the world who registered, like 20% of them were international. So, um, so it was true, you know, that was true that like that was the need um, that this film was well suited to, to filling. And I just, I think it's a journey to find that. We found it at the point where the film was released, but we might not have found it for two or three years after the film was released. And I think that would be okay. And I just wish that, um, that there was more support and funding for these things um, that played out in that more kind of organic fashion in, um, in partnership with the communities who who you're who it makes sense to work with yeah definitely wow that's exciting though that there's so many people who want to get involved mm -hmm. um Marjan or vivian did you have anything you wanted to add in relation to your films and and sorry in relation to impact 
Yeah, I was going to say, first of all, I should have clicked my unmute before Nicole, because there is no way to follow the impact that <laughs> Nicole and Jim have had with their film. Um, so I feel really stupid for not being a quicker draw. Um, but also knowing Nicole and Jim, and, and especially Jim, you know, Jim has had impact with Crip Camp, but Jim has had impact in our field, right? Completely transformative impact in our, in our field because there is no real separation between impact for the film and impact like how he walks in the world, right? I shouldn't say walks in the world, that's the wrong word to use for Jim. How he rolls in the world. <laughs> and, I really enjoy ribbing you for that right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's sort of part of it. I mean, I think one of the things I struggle with is we went through a phase, I think in the early uh, stages of impact and documentaries, right? Where it was a very prescriptive kind of formula and there was a whole bunch of films that had this like tacked on impact thing at the end. So there was like a whole film and then there was like three minutes of a slideshow at the end that told you the 10 things you should do. Um, and, you know, power to those films. They started a thing. A lot of people went out and changed their light bulbs. You know, all of that. that that's good stuff. But actually, I think what Nicole is talking about gets us closer um, which is to really meet the community, right? And not come in with an, well, actually it's what Gretchen was saying as well. It's not like imposing on the community um, and that it should come from the community because they know best, you know, how this tool can be useful to the conversations that they're, you know, already having. Um, so we, for our impact work, and I don't think like Stephanie, we didn't set out to make an impact film, right? But it, um, it just, we, we did want to shine a light. We, we wanted to, we've talked about power a couple of times today. For us, a lot of what was at the heart of the impact of this film was to like move the idea of power from where we generally associate it to a new place, right? And to assign power to women of color, but also to these, the communities, right? Like the new American majority, the changing America, where, where really there's power to be taken and now we sort of feel like we, we, we sort of have crystal balls or something because here we are in 2020 and like literally the whole nation is focused on Georgia and the organizers in Georgia and how they've built these coalitions. And every day I see stories in the Washington Post and the New York Times about the very women that we followed, organizers that folks didn't know their names or anything about them, right, when we found them. Um, not anything about them, but they certainly weren't sort of front page news, right? And so... Part of our goal, I can't take full credit for that, but part of our goal was to um, change the, per the perception of what does power look like and how does power, how is power built and claimed? Um, and then to really create a sense of narrative shift around that, right? Which is beyond like a change of policy or get people to sign a petition, but like long-term culture shift around how we talk about ideas of power and especially power of women of color. Um, and like uh, Nicole and co, you know, we went to a, a firm who were strategists, women of color strategists, not in the documentary space. We we're the first documentary that they really worked with, but they absolutely are at the epicenter of political power and women of color. And they knew what was needed, who the audience was, where we we're going to find them. I don't, we've done very little in the traditional lane of like, Camp, college campus screenings or whatever. We'll do that. We'll get to that, right? But, but we've really focused on uh, speaking to that audience who maybe doesn't know that they that a documentary film in our case one on public television has anything to do with their lives or sees them in any way but in fact it is their story you know so I think we should I, I, what I hope for the field is that we can kind of loosen up a little bit how we think about this idea of impact um, and trust the filmmakers because we immerse ourselves in these universes so we kind of have a sense of what what is needed it may not fit the box of like First you do this and then you do this, right? Um, but it's actually, if we actually wanna to get to real impact, then we need to sort of come at it in a multiplicity of ways, each formed around the specifics of that story and that community. I just wanna briefly just share also that uh, with Decorative Fire, I think that, you know, again, I didn't know the formula for what an impact uh, campaign was supposed to be. I know that I just entered into a space where um, you know, uh, because of uh, Julia, who had an understanding of housing justice and was a, a national organizer, you know, we spent a lot of time um, traveling around the country, um, uh, screening the film to uh, many local 
organizations, most uh, housing justice organizations, and they, um, the screenings were done, uh, you know, it was done via their condition. We didn't, we didn't impose what we were going to do, how we were going to do it. Um, we actually made sure that uh, these organizations would not have to um, absorb any cost. So we covered the cost of any, you know, we provided stipends for food, for renting chairs, whatever. And, um, and I think that what I loved about what you guys just talked about was that, you know, these screenings, it, 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 yes, people took a lot from the film, people enjoyed the film, but it, in these spaces, it, they became community places of healing. They became community places of, you know, of let's talk and figure out how we're gonna make this, you know, this housing situation better. It elevated conversations. The conversations were very different from coast to coast, you know, from what, Kentucky, from Miami, from Georgia, from St. Louis, wherever we were, you know, different groups um, had different takeaways in terms of what they wanted to activate. It was all on their terms. Um, and then we left. Um, and, you know, and, and I think that's a very interesting kind of like situation is that with these impact statements, you go in to a community, you show your film, you have conversations, and then you're not there anymore. The question is then what do you really leave behind that's of value for these organizations to continue to sustain? Okay, I just want to add one thing, if I may, and Stephanie touched on it earlier, but I think it's really important, which is that we can't underestimate the actual impact of seeing yourself and your story represented, right? And I think that all of our projects um, allow all sorts of people that we will never meet and we will never know their names and we will never have a conversation with them. And we will also never know how something changed inside them in terms of a, an idea of what might be possible mm -hmm. for me by seeing their story on a screen, right? And I think that that's part of this kind of wonderfully rich and complicated and messy kind of moment of transformation that we're in in our field. I never grew up seeing someone who was like, you know, an immigrant. From, the only immigrants from Iran I saw on my screens were people who were very much unlike me, <laughs> you know? Um, and, you know, that defined, you know, an entire people in a different, so, so I think that there's a soft side to impact Pack that's not measurable and you can't report back to your funder in a bar chart or whatever, but it doesn't make it less impactful at all by any measure. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I really, that's so true. I work in nonprofits and it's the same. It's like, you know, the, the idea, like, like Gretchen, you were talking about, you're supposed to know how to do 5 million things uh, and do them all perfectly. And, um, and, and this idea of like the ways that we do have impact in our work are not measurable. They're not things that we can give to, to, grant grantors, people who distribute grants, <laughs> um, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it's much more intangible in that way. And so I think, thank you so much for sharing all of these different, like, ways that you do impact and ways that, you know, the, the idea of impact itself is a little bit uh, nebulous and concerning. Um, I want to I just touch on that real quick. I also, I, I just think that, like, I mean, I think that documentary field has, like, gone so much into the impact that we're losing sight of the art. And I think that we are artists and we are creating a cinematic experience that is immersive. And when you look at a Kara Walker or a piece of art, you sit there and you look at it and you walk away and you feel different. And that is not like Marjan saying, Marjan, sorry, is I can't give a pie chart of what that looks like. Because uh, that Harvard student said to me, that's funny you said that because this was the most impactful film I've seen in this class. You know, so I think that we are, we have to remind ourselves and all the um, people who are attending this, like we are creating art and art is something that is immersive and experiential and a feeling that you're capturing, that you're hoping to convey to other people through this medium called cinema. And I just want to remind people that like we have to fill out all these forms for to get the funding. But remember, that is at foremost, I think, something we should always be keeping in mind. I would love to add something. I, I really appreciate that. And I also think that 
knowing that like we are you know like knowing what you do <laughs> is really important that are you an activist or are you film you know like and you can be a filmmaker activist those people exist and or you can be a pure filmmaker but i do think the question that um was really critical for us in finding our path forward with how to tell the story we wanted to tell was like who is this story for and, and really answering the question of audience. And I feel like Mar Marianne, you've like, also we're talking about specifically like seeing somebody seeing their own story told um, is, and is really important. And I think um, I'm only bringing it up because that was actually the first hurdle <laughs> before we could get funded for like production or impact or anything we had to get funding, we just had to have people believe that there was an audience for a film about a place like the Bronx that was for people from the Bronx and that that is an actual audience that deserves a film and is actually going to turn out and buy a film and watch a film and talk about a film. And that I think culturally that has shifted since like we started making this film, but I don't think that by any means like we are there, you know, especially when in an age when like the gatekeepers for like film distribution have actually like become like these huge monopolies very recently. Um, so I, I just wanted to bring that up as, as that determining that as part of your filmmaking process is like you can't, I couldn't, you can't undersell that. A lot of people start making a film, and they're like, it's for everybody. Like, not really. Like, probably if you're saying that, then you're going to be, you're actually making it for someone who's exactly like you are. Um, so really think about, you know, and I think for us, it was really helpful to be like, okay, well, the first people we're going to show it to are people who lived this. <laughs> so we got it. We can't mess around, you know. <laughs> uh, so just adding that into yeah. the mix as far as like, impact can be like an outgrowth of that but that's the really that's kind of the bedrock of like no matter what kind of film you're going to make yeah thank you for that um I, I feel like that like who is your audience and audience analysis is so critical and also like that there are audiences that deserve media for them uh and that you know those are often the audiences that don't see themselves represented very often and aren't being funded and stephanie i like that i really appreciate the reminder of like filmmaking as an art right that like that, that yeah that was great um so one thing i i could talk about this kind of stuff all day and night but i you know there are actual filmmakers in the audience that want to like i feel like a little bit of the business side the technical side is really useful for folks, especially aspiring filmmakers who are trying to get into this space. And so there's a question from Julie in chat um, that asks, I'd love to hear from the co-directing teams on the panel, what it was like to work with another partner in that role. I know Nicole, you had a co-director and then Gretchen and Vivian, you worked together. So if you had thoughts about what that uh, what experience was like for you. Yeah, I mean, um, I always co-direct. Um, I just thought I like working with people. <laughs> I like the collaborative aspect of, of documentary filmmaking in particular, you know? Um, and um, I love having a partner in crime um, because it's hard. And so uh, that was not new to me on Crip Camp, but, um, but what was new to me was to be making, to have a co-director who was part of the community that I was making the film about. And that, um, and also who was a uh, new filmmaker, um, I mean, a new director. Um, Jim is like a very experienced sound designer but hadn't made a film before, kind of similar to, um, to Vivian, you know, your, your role. And, um, and I loved it. I mean, um, I agree that I think that it, it required a more kind of like in-depth, rigorous process. Um, there were not so many assumptions being made. Um, everything had to be discussed and kind of worked out. and. Um, and, and I think that that made a better film. I think we ended up, um, we ended up being a better filmmaking team because of the um, adherence to, um, to kind of the principles of disability justice actually. And this, um, this idea that, you know, if somebody requires any kind of accommodation, you give it to them. And that played out throughout our entire production process. You know, what we, ended up feeling was that film filmmaking can often be a lot of the kind of culture of filmmaking um, 
can actually not be conducive to collaboration. There's sort of a culture of like, you work really hard, you work all the time, you, your total focus is on the film. Um, and if you can't hack it, you know, then that's some sort of issue. And, um, and we had to just be like, um, no, actually, like if you, if you need a mental health day, you know, that's a reasonable accommodation. If you need time off for, with your kid, you know, et cetera, which just basically made us all um, better able to respect and listen to each other. Um, and, um, and I really think that that's like due to that kind of shift um, that uh, that Jim brought into the equation by kind of bringing his disability culture um, in into the into the filmmaking process. So nice. Gretchen, Vivian, do you have thoughts about, I know you talked already about the sort of like learning how to filmmake, uh, filmmake? Wow. <laughs> I guess that works sort of um, through this process, but like, were there tensions there or difficulties um, that came about with that kind of relationship? Or did you find it like super empowering? I'm curious what your experiences were there. You want to go first, Vivian? Go ahead, Gretchen. <laughs> oh, I mean, um, it, it, it was, you know, it, it, we worked, we met on a weekly basis, like for years, you know, and it was, I, I think we had a similar experience to what Nicole described in that, like, um, nothing could be taken for granted, like, why do we have a spotting session and then we do what like what what is the sequence of events and why you know uh, like that all had to get interrogated um and kind of broken down and but that was really useful because when we're when we have you know like when when it's one person or maybe a team of filmmakers who work together all the time like you're you do kind of like plow ahead in a way um, without questioning the decisions that you're making. Um, but it was, I mean, it was, it was a really wonderful experience for me. I don't know, Vivian, what you want to say about that. I mean, we, we definitely like are intertwined in a way that I don't think we'll ever not be intertwined. Because um, it, it's, it's so much work, you know, we had to go through a lot together. I think, yeah, I think that um, it was a very um, complicated relationship and uh, it was difficult, but not difficult because we didn't like each other. We didn't want to work with each other it was because there was just so much work to do and we had to figure things out. And I had a I had a lot of figuring out to do. Gretchen also had, so did Julia. I mean, Julia, and so did Neda. I mean, the four of us, we just had to figure a lot out. And so, um, you know, the difficulty wasn't in the, uh, the sort of the energy, but it was just in the work. Um, and we were all committed to having a consensus um, process. And we had a lot of consensus, um, you, know, uh, you know, at one point, uh, I just was like, I don't care about the color of the font, please, <laughs> you know? And they were like, no, we need you to tell us what color you prefer. All right, you're not a real filmmaker if you don't care about the color of the font. <laughs> just kidding. Was, well, you know, but it was like between a dark yellow and a lighter yellow. And I'm thinking, oh my God, <laughs> you know? Um, so um, so uh, I think that... Um, you know, I am from the South Bronx. I went through the, the trauma of the fires. The research was very painful. What happened to com my community was very painful. I still lived it. My family lived it. My community lived it. A lot of us didn't get out. It was painful. It was rough sometimes. And, you know, while my other partners were angry about it sometimes, I sort of had a different feeling about things at times. And at times, you know, um, I, uh, you know, I sort of withdrew and sometimes I wanted to just lash out. And sometimes, you know, I just didn't understand how we were going to tell a story that people cared about, even though I was just so angry about it. I mean, I had a lot of emotions and what I have to say in my relationship and working with Gretchen um, and Julia and Neva was that they held me. 
you know, they, they created a space where I felt like I was nurtured and I was given time, as you mentioned, Nicole, to sort of relax or, you know, think things through or process um, some of the pain and some of the sort of, um, sort of uncharted territory that I was entering into because I was um, sort of learning about this. I mean, I, we knew all along, but sort of to get the granular information about what happened and why, and it still doesn't make sense why these decisions were made to destroy my community. It still doesn't make sense, but nevertheless, you know, sort of I had, um, I had my sisters to help me get through this process. And I don't think that I would have been able to do a film without Gretchen, without Julia, without Neda. Um, they wouldn't have been able to make the film without me either. Um, so, you know, it was sort of, it, was, it yeah. was difficult in that sense, but it was throughout, I don't think that there was a time when we all felt like, oh, okay, we're going to give up. This is not, you know, we don't like this or we don't like each other. It had nothing like that. Yeah. Um, in fact, I think that be, I think that what Gretchen said is that we're intertwined now. We went through such a very um, intense process that will always be, um, you know, sisters in crime, no matter what happens to us in life. That's right, lovely. Gretchen? Yeah. <laughs> I, what I'm hearing is that for both of these groups uh, or both of the teams, it's like uh, there's so much... Um, different perspectives that are brought into the relationship that make the film stronger, but that there's also the tensions that come with like working with other humans, right? That that can be difficult and challenging, but ultimately it sounds like it, it made your films stronger and, and better um, to go through that process. Um, I want to wrap up yeah, with- Lisa, can I add one oh, really quick thing? Please, I think, of um, course. Like Nicole, I've co-directed a lot. And if anyone out there is thinking about it, I think it really matters who you pick. Like, don't try and do, like, if you, whoever your partner is in life, however much you spend thinking about, am I going to be with this person for the rest of my life? Think that hard about, like, your, your co-directing partner, because you spend way more time with them than you spend with your actual life partner, so you <laughs> yeah. better, you know, like them. But also, I just want to say, I think part of the vestigial tale that we have inherited from how documentaries started is this sort of very manly, like white manny kind of like altery kind of thing that we all learned in film school, right? We were all taught like this is how storytelling is a singular vision. It's never a singular vision. There's like hundreds of people in that, those credits. You have to sit through them. You know how many people <laughs> contributed to any piece of work. And I think part of what we can also do is um, rid ourselves of some sort of um, maybe outdated ideas of what is a valid storytelling voice or whatever, and understand that that's part of the package we've inherited of kind of old world framing that doesn't need to be true for us moving forward. I just had to get on my soapbox about that. Yeah, I love it. I think that's so, so important is that like things don't have to be how they always have been. Right. That a, a lot of the work that you are all doing and all of these other wonderful um, filmmakers uh, who are come from underrepresented backgrounds are really challenging the notions of what it means to uh, make films, what films can look like, what films should do, and that we should not be stuck in these regressive ideas just because that's how they've always been. And so I, I'm, I've been very excited about um, media and film and, and, and the, the, uh, I'm going to get too caught up in progress, but in, in like what we're seeing right now in the last decade, there's been a huge shift. And, and I think you are all a, a, an incredible part of that shift in telling these really important stories. So I thank you all for your time today. I thank you for letting me be here with you, asking you my personal geeky questions. <laughs> and um, I think Ebony will come back on to wrap this out. Thank you all for being here. This was fascinating. I know we had, um, uh, several first time documentary makers who, you know, private messaged me to say, this is great. Thank you so much for this. A couple of them posted in chat. I know we've got some of them on Facebook watching too. This has just been really a fascinating discussion between um, just some phenomenal filmmakers. So Gretchen, Stephanie, Marge, Nicole, Vivian, thank you again um, for being here. This has just been immeasurably great. Um, so yeah, I wanna thank everyone, all of our audience members for joining us. Um, 
we, this is our last uh, speaker series for, of 2020. It's been a very challenging year, but we thank you for sticking with us. We will be back in 2021 with our annual WIF Shorts Night on January 27th. I please hope, um, you know, join us for that event. You'll be, get to see member shorts, um, participate in a panel discussion with those great filmmakers. We would love to have you continue to be part of the WIF family. But again, thank you to the filmmakers who are here with us today. Thank you for talking about this art form that you love um, and about the challenges and the triumphs that are you know, available to us um, as creatives, but also as audience members um, for, for this kind of work. Thank you so much. Um, and Nita, do you have any final words you wanna share? No, should I? <laughs> no, I just didn't know if there was some Wear a mask. Piece of wisdom Be you safe. wanted to share with us. But no, we are we are grateful for all of you for being here. Thank you so much. And so on that note, I will see all of our audience, I hope, in 2021. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.